The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Geosystems. Hello, and welcome to our live webcast, Improve Civil, BIM, and Plant Workflows with 3D Laser Scanning Hardware, presented by Leica Geosystems and Catalyst. Thank you all for attending and taking your time to spend with us today. My name is Kurt Marino, blogger at Kung Fu Drafter and a Catalyst Contributing Editor, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. During today's webcast, all attendees will be on mute. To submit a question for our speakers, type it into the question panel on the right side of your screen at any time throughout the presentation. We've set aside time at the end of our presentation for Q&A, so keep those questions coming. Also today, we will be having a demo and presentation, or de a demo during our presentation, so be sure and keep an eye on your screen. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce our guests from Leica Geosystems, Mr. Mike Harvey and David Langley who are here to give us some great insight on 3D laser scanning and how it works and how it will help overcome any of the challenges in today's 3D CAD workflow. Mike and David, how are you doing today? Doing great, doing great. Glad Very to be good. here. Thank you. Great. Now, you two are uh, keeping it green and coming in on one computer, so we only see David's name, but Mike and David are there together. Yep. And then we also have Sonia, Sonia Delgadillo and Joseph Dixon with Intergraph CADWorks and Analysis Solutions. Sonia and Joseph, how are you doing today? Great, thank you. Glad to be here. Great. Well, I tell you what, today we have a great presentation that's going to be presented by Mr. Mike Harvey and David. So let's go ahead and turn it over to Mike and let's get started. Mike, we're going to throw it right to you. Okay, so um, you know, we have a, a bunch of slides, and uh, you know, again, that uh, the the basis of today was to create kind of a discussion of you know the right hardware for the right tool, you know, using the right tool for each job. Um, you know that the field portion um, of of laser scanning is probably pretty about twenty percent of the overall workflow. However, that small twenty percent. Uh, being very important because it enabled the other 80%, which is the software portion. Um, so you want to mean by that if you have poor data or using the wrong scanner uh, for the wrong job, that the, the software portion becomes rather impossible. Um, so anyway, like I said, we'll go over plant them in civil survey. Um, so one of the you know major uh, one of the major things with uh, with, uh, I'm going to go into plant first. So one of the problems, of course, you know, plants really have a lot of current as-built, uh, especially in brownfield situations. Um, uh, and then the uh, main contributor for, for laser scanning, of course, is to uh, is to eliminate go-backs and uh, and um, uh, rework. So uh, that that's a main thing um, with the, with the plant. So as you can see here, the traditional is you know you can do manual labor with uh, with tapes and uh, those types of things that takes a lot of time. Um, usually, it's not accurate. There's a lot of go-backs. There's sometimes it's not safe because you got to climb around on these uh, racks of pipes, and I kind of call it spaghetti bill. Uh, and it's all paper. Uh, but of course, in, what we wanted to do here is that in, in kind of show that what you're going to get with a laser scanner is going to be much different than going on traditional, um, especially when you combine it with uh, the CatWorks field pipe. Um, uh, this is one of the many plant solutions that customers have available to them. Um, nice thing with CADWorks and Fieldbike, you can use either HCS or TPS. Um, so that, that actually brings up an interesting point, is that it uh, depends on whether you want to use a, a total station or you want to use laser scanning. So laser scanning, typically, you're going to have a very large site, um, and those, those are going to capture things quite well. Um, you can also use TPS um, on small, small things. So there are certain little pipelines that need to be done. So again, it's the right, right hardware for the right job. Uh, so Mike, let me ask you, for the layman here, uh, including myself, well, especially myself, could you explain what HDS and TPS is? Sure. So HDS is your high definition, high definition surveying. So um, that's your laser scanning. Uh, that was a kind of a, coin, a term coined by Lake, Lake Geosystems. Um, and then TPS is your traditional total station um, technology um, so that you're going to you know, have a guy behind 
total station, pushing the button, or you use it from a controller. Uh, okay. Of course, and HDS, you had mentioned that laser scanning is for a larger site. How large a site can you do with the laser scanner? Uh, well, the largest site that I've ever scanned was a 56-acre uh, site in, in downtown, downtown Boston, but you can go much larger than that. You know, we have wow. uh, customers that scan uh, in civil survey. They scan miles of a highway, um, and it's of course when you're talking about plant. Um, you know, you just have some of these oil and gas refineries that are just um, several hundred acres wide, huge. I mean, those things are just ginormous plants. Uh, definitely scan those things. So, um, you know, it depends. The, the the amount of data is going to grow. Um, so that's also important for selecting the right software. You know, lucky for us, we have a software that can handle that type of uh, data. Uh, and then we also have, uh, you know, we have several different types of laser scanners um, to, to select from it. You know, if we have anywhere from time of flight uh, scanners all the way to, uh, you know, we do have uh, ability to get phase scanners. And then, of course, we have uh, a new thing, uh, or real new to Leica, which is called the waveform digitizing technology. So. Uh, it's kind of a combination of time of flight and phase. We get the best of both worlds. Um, you know, the range with time of flight and the speed with phase all wrapped up in, into one scan. And that's wow, really that really is. It does sound like you are look. You have the set of tools for different situations, so it is the right tool for the right job. Right. Yeah, that's where you know the larger sites having the right tool really does come into play, and that's where you need to strategically, you know, determine which scanner you're going to use. Um, you know, where you're going to use it on those sites and, and things of that nature. Yep. So, Mike, what, I, I think that you have a slide for us about determining the, the workflow and determining what to use. Am I right? Right. So, so uh, in the slide that we got up here is pretty much, you know, a plant workflow. So, um, the main point of this slide is that, and you'll see this slide happen two more times as we go through the presentation, but uh, the main point is to really get across that the data work, the field work, and the data collection and combining scans is a very linear process. And there isn't much change that you can do in these processes. Uh, and the point is, as soon as you're done with registration, is where the workflow can explode into hundreds of different methodologies. Um, the only methodology you really need to worry about with field is whether you're going to use a traversing type workflow, uh, which is very similar to surveyors in, in total station work. Uh, whether you use a three station uh, scanning, which means you set the scanner up anywhere and just acquire targets. Um, and then you can also do free station with no targets. So you, in the registration process, you use uh, like corners uh, inside the actual uh, massive point cloud to merge everything together. Um, but uh, again, that's it's a very linear workflow. Um, and then once you get over into um, the data processing is where the workflows are going to explode. Now, the one caveat there is, again, as I said earlier, that the data collection and combining the scans govern how easy that the rest of the, the workflow is. So even though it's a small 20% of the workflow, it is completely dependent on the rest. Um, so uh, I had some images here of an actual oil and gas place that, uh, that I was lucky, lucky enough to get in there and scan. And I can't tell you where it is because that was an agreement that I signed. but. Uh, in this instance, you're going to use, uh, I use the uh, uh, RP20 scanner, which is a, a waveform digitizing scanner. So it scans a million points per second. It's very fast. Um, I use that. Wow, did you say a million points? million points per second. Uh, and then uh, I use the resolution of what, there's different resolutions. So resolution means how close together each point is at a certain, re at a certain distance. Uh, and then the quality is, um, it's a number of times that it shoots a ranging distance uh, and it kind of, uh, it fines tune accuracy, which we call accumulations. Um, so that uh, I used a, a resolution of 6.3 millimeters at 10 meters. So that means you get a point every 6.3 millimeters um, square at the range of 10 meters. Um, so about three and a half minutes to scan. Uh, it took about five to six minutes to take an image. Um, this scan, uh, that you're looking at actual scans as images, those scans are around 44 million points per scan. Uh, so wow. it, uh, it goes pretty quick. So you have you know, life-like uh, representations of the actual scene. Um, there's also a tool that's very handy on a lot of scanners. Um, and we have it too. It's, it's called the My Favorite Scan Button. Um, it allows basically one button scanning. So 
Um, as soon as that you set up the parameters and uh, you move the scanner, you just hit this one button, the scanner goes. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, the data collection is boring because uh, you hit one button, you watch the scanner do its thing. Uh, but again, it is using the right tool for the right job is paramount to support the back end. Well, that's, that sounds like it also reduces the amount, the high end of expertise that you would have to have in some situations. You can have people that are adequately trained but not high expertise to go out and do these scans if they're using the My Favorite Scan feature. Correct. I mean, it certainly helps with the, with the workflows, especially if you're going to use a free station type of methodology. It's just pretty much pick up the scanner, move it to a location, and then push a button. Uh, it doesn't get much easier than that. Um, and now, Mike, our guests are always asking a question whenever we see one of these scans. Could you explain the, the scan image and how it looks like a photograph, how that process occurs? Yes, absolutely. So, um, so our scanners take two passes. So uh, you're going to do the scan first. So we'll collect every single scan measurement. Uh, and then you'll take a second pass and take uh, a series of images, uh, which we call a multi-image. Um, and then in the software, when you import it, uh, what happens is that the image is then projected onto the point cloud. So everywhere there is a measured point from the point cloud, it will extract the RGB value from the image and colorize the, the point cloud. Uh, so it gives it that photorealistic um, touch and feel uh, of the scene. So uh, you're basically looking at strictly point cloud data uh, that has been colorized from the image. Okay, and Mike, we actually have our first question here, mm -hmm. and one of our guests is asking if you could explain registration yep. and what is involved with it as it pertains to laser scanning. Sure. How much effort and time does something like that take? It, uh, you have a lot of options with registration, uh, and this is a great question. Um, I kind of a liking a registration to putting together a massive jigsaw puzzle. Um, so as long as you like jigsaw puzzles, registration is your friend. Um, and it also will depend on the, on the, uh, the type of methodology you use in the field. Uh, for example, if you use a traversing type of methodology out in the field, so that means set the scanner up over a known point in your back sighting, a known point as you would with traditional survey methodology. When the data is downloaded off the scanner, it is pre-registered. You don't have to do anything. It's already done for you. Um, if you're using a free station type of methodology, um, you have, you can either use targets. These targets can be named or they can be unnamed. So the software has the ability to either use IDs to put scans together or it is smart enough to find geometry uh, between targets to put it together. Um, and now the, the targets third, are those little, um, little cross-eye looking tags correct. and stickers. Yes, okay. that's correct. Uh, and then the, the other method is, uh, is what we call cloud-to-cloud -cloud registration. So you physically have, you open up two clouds, you give each one a couple of seed pick points, and then the computer will go through and run this ginormous uh, least squares adjustment using every single scan point in there to find the fit between the two. Uh, very accurate. So those are the, the main ways that you can do uh, registration. Okay, well that clears that up. Um, so uh, one of the things I wanted to, to uh, go over is, is kind of put a dollar figure to this. Um, uh, so some of the things that you're going to need to do, whether you do a, a laser scanning or use a total station, um, each one's going to make a difference. But I made a, an analogy here of, of the upper picture of that you know, tank with, uh, with all those pipes um, and kind of guesstimated what it would take with you know, a scanner to collect that amount of data. Um, and then, of course, what it would take with a total station. Um, you know, for me, I would not use a total station for this type of thing because it's too big. Uh, but again, you know, booting up, setting up the instrument, I mean, that's basically getting out the set of legs, putting the instrument on there, takes a minute. Um, and then uh, to fire up the scanner, minute and a half, you know, minute to minute and a half, that's nothing. Uh, to set up a project on the scanner, takes about 30 seconds. Uh, and then to scan. So in the case that we just talked about, three, or three and a half minutes, images, I was on the, the uh, the high side there, but I put six six minutes, and then move to the next setup. So that break it down, uh, and then I physically pick up everything and move to the next setup in about three minutes. Um, so, and if I was assuming a cost from a customer using around two hundred fifty dollars an hour, um, you know, each setup is going to be in the vicinity of sixty to seventy dollars, uh, as I put there. Um, now, if I was to do the same thing with the total station, 
Um, and this is, is using uh, the intergraph field type methodology. Um, it's going to be a little different because physically you're drafting out in the field, um, which, is, uh, which is super cool. Um, you're basically taking a total station. You take several measurements. To, you identify the diameter. You identify center lines and flanges and those types of things. However, uh, again, you're doing single points at a time. Um, and uh, you can see that the cost difference is quite different there. Uh, but well, again, that, that is very profound because we're looking at the difference between a quarter of an hour and a full day's worth, of, a full man day. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. That, that is amazing. Right. Now, the bonus, with, now the bonus that you're going to have with a total station, again, as I said before, uh, and I'm sure Joe and Sonia will echo this, that if you're doing a small area, total station is probably pretty good. Because the nice thing is when you're done with this, that, uh, uh, with doing the total station work, the model is already done because you're physically creating the model in the field. Super cool. Uh, with the laser scan, you're going to need to take the point cloud and, and create the models in the back end. However, again, if you have the wrong scanner and not enough data, the back end is going to be impossible. So uh, having the right data is very, very important. Um, so again, as I just said, so with, uh, with Sonia and, uh, and Joe's software, basically, Here's the entire workflow. Now that you've created this rich point cloud, you can bring it into their software. You can create the 3D model. You can now take, you get your material takeoffs, put it into another product they call Isogen to get your isometrics. You can do clash detection, uh, compare it with the Asbuild, and they have another product called Caesar, which uh, does um, uh, load and stress analysis. So now you've completed the entire picture. But again, all of that is dependent on using the right scanner, getting the right job, uh, getting the right data. And all of these software solutions are available from Intergraph? Yes. So um, what I'm going to do is, and then uh, and this is uh, the overall scan of this uh, oil and gas plate that I did. So again, I did 30 scans in about five and a half hours. Um, and this is approximately three quarters of a billion points, billion with a B, uh, that comprise this entire set, this and this is just a small, tiny section of, uh, of a plant. It almost looks like an impressionist painting. Yes. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, is I'm going to throw it over to Sonia right now. And because of, you know, in, in, uh, uh, because we have this great data, um, she's going to show a little bit of a, uh, uh, a demo of just three to five minutes of because you have now point cloud data that you can go ahead and create these three-dimensional um, uh, subjects in, in inside their software because uh, um, their software is, is super cool. Uh, and if you're doing types and those types of things, this is this is the bomb. So yeah, let me let me step in for just a second. We had some latecomers, and I want to remind you that while we're doing our presentation and our demos, and our attendees are muted, please do remember that you can submit a question at, to our speakers at any time. Just type it into question into the question panel on the right side of your screen for during the presentation. And then also, please remember that this recording, the slide deck, and other information will be available for download after the recording. So Sonia, earlier I was concerned about saying your last name right. And then I flubbed saying Sonia because I was so concerned about saying Delegadio. <laughs> so Sonia, welcome. Uh, you work with Intergraph with Joe, correct? Yes, thank you, Kurt. I do. I'm the uh, CADWorks specialist here. Okay, and what exactly is CADWorks? So CADWorks is a plan design suite. Um, CADWorks is a, an intelligent modeling system. It's based off of AutoCAD. So we have uh, what makes it intelligent is the piping specifications that allow us to draw piping systems intelligently. And, and not only do we allow the ability to have a piping design system with you being able to draw pipes and steel, maybe HVAC equipment, but we also focus a lot on the integration that we have with our other software packages. And that's um, collabor the collaboration that can actually or does exist in the real life, in real life scenarios where design has to a lot of times give that information off to analysis. So we focus on an entire, um, like uh, we focus a lot on the collaboration between design and analysis to give that benefit of, of seamless collaboration for, from both systems. Um, so interoperability we, is a very high priority at Intergraph. 
It is, and it's even now a bigger focus, uh, being that uh, this CAD works, CAD design application um, is owned by Intergrav. Intergrav has their own smart plan software, right? This data-centric software, which is not CAD-based. Now that we're all the same company, our focus is now even bigger. The synergy between these two applications has, has grown tremendously. So we can also not only collaborate with analysis, but we can also collaborate with these larger um, software systems like SmartPlant uh, Foundation. So we can bring in all the, all the modeling that's done in these smaller packages into their mainframes, and then we can use the data as we wish to in that Vitamin. Okay, and it looks like you've got a great demonstration set up for us. We have one quick question from an attendee that we should go ahead and touch on. We can see that you're using CADWorks on the AutoCAD platform. Now, our question specifically asks, does this work with Revit? But in addition, what other platforms does it work with? Currently, this is an AutoCAD-based solution. Revit would be, is Revit, it does not work on Revit, right, although we have the Leica Geosystem product, CloudWorks working with Revit, which I believe Mike is going to cover a little bit later on. Yeah, we'll show that in a minute. All right. But there's, there's a lot of CloudWorks products. Um, so uh, as Sony was saying, I'm sorry to cut you off, but uh, there's a, they're using a technology that, uh, that because Intergraph and Leica are actually sister companies, um, and we have the ability to actually do a lot of handshaking back and forth, which is uh, quite advantageous to, to customers. Uh, so they're using our CloudWorks for AutoCAD technology. So basically, it's bringing the entire point cloud into the AutoCAD environment. So now they can use their tools to, to pipe off of it. Uh, but we have plugins for um, you know, Intergraph Smart Plant 3D, Smart Plant Review. We got uh, AutoCAD, Bentley uh, MicroStation. Uh, we have 3ds Max. We got Revit. We have Maya. Uh, and the list goes on and on, and I'm sure there'll be more in the future. Wow, that's a big list of applications to shake a stick at. All right, Sonia, well, why don't you get to this awesome demo that you've obviously got set up for us. Okay, so essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using Leica CloudWorks to allow us to manipulate the point cloud, hide points, restore points if we need to, to create an intelligent piping system with, like you said, with CadWorks on Professional. So, the, so what we're looking at is a product called CADWorks Build Pipe that allows us to work with point clouds. Now, the main idea with my demonstration is to show all the attendees how easy it is to uh, bring in a point cloud. That I was able to bring in the point cloud. That's all done with Cyclone, as everybody else would be familiar with. Once you have the data, it's very easy to get it open, and it's even easier to work with the data inside uh, CADWorks. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to be using AutoCAD and I'm going to go and focus on a, this orthogonal view and more or less identify the area that I want to work with, which is right here in the center. Now I'm going to be using the Leica CloudWorks tools to isolate points, to get rid of the uh, points of data that I don't want to see. So the, the area that I want to isolate is this area right here. So I just So basically what I'm doing is I'm coming in and I'm cleaning up my point cloud, kind of focusing on the line that I want to focus on. So I continue doing the same thing. All I'm doing is just using Leica CloudWorks to help me get this, uh, this clean up. And this uh, is not nice destructive. Point if is you wanted to get those points back, you could? Yes. Ah, yes. They're not physically gone away. They're just hiding them from view. So uh, this, is, this is maybe the only thing that will take up some time. You'll notice that as soon as I'm done cleaning it up, the uh, process to the actual process of creating an intelligent pipe is uh, goes by very quick, and you really do need to pay attention to that because you'll be uh, very surprised with how fast that can be done. Okay, so as soon as I clean up this area, maybe I want to go to a different area here, maybe go to a front area, and here's a little bit more that I want to clean up. Now, the reason why I want to clean it up as much as I can is because we have to understand that we are working with an AutoCAD-based system. And what that means is that now, since, since nowadays everybody works in 3D, if we start getting into a view other than this view that I'm in right now, we start looking at the model from an isometric perspective. So if we were in an isometric perspective, being that we have a lot of data here, what ends up happening is that we start seeing these points that may appear to be right on top of the pipe in some cases, and they're actually not. These uh, points that maybe we forget to remove or we don't clean up correctly as we should, 
what ends up happening is that, like I said, they appear like they appear to be right on top of the pipe, and sometimes that causes a little bit of issues when we're trying to go in there and quickly identify the nominal pipe sizes, et cetera. So I'm almost done. I'm just going to do some last uh, some last touches here. It's just going to hide points, and I'm just all I'm doing is just using AutoCAD to do a window command and isolate all that data that I really don't want to use. And I'm pretty much done. So now I can start the piping process with CADWorks fill pipe. Okay, so here's my nice model. So the first step when we use CADWorks fill pipe is, of course, the product comes with its own specification, so you can use what's out of the box. You can customize those to meet your needs. You can always add more components to those if needed. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and I'm going to select a project spec a specification. So here within this project, I have a series of specifications I can work with, um, as well as you can notice that there's tons of sizes here that I can choose from. And again, all of this is customizable. You can go in and add anything you want. All I've done is set up the spec. Just give it some data. Now I'm ready to go ahead and create the pipe here, to create this intelligent piping system. We have some tools that allow us to come in and say, well, I have one piping system here, and I want to convert this to an intelligent piece of pipe. All I did was pick that pipe, and it recognizes the size, okay, and it places it accurately for us that fast, okay? So now I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing. So again, we have different ways of doing this. If we have individual pieces of pipe, I continue with this piping without elbows. And in a few moments, you'll notice me go to this other option where I actually want to place the elbows automatically. So we'll get there soon enough. So here I have uh, another piece of pipe. And so, so now I'm, I'm almost done, but I still want to continue piping. So what I'll do is I use that first, uh, that first button here that I told you is also available. Now look at what happens. I'm just going to simply pick a pipe, pick a pipe, pick a pipe, and done. Now one thing that I do want to kind of emphasize here that when we take a laser, when we go and our HDS team creates a laser scan of a facility, what you get is the actual piping system as it is out, out on the field. This piping system is not the exact piping system that was actually designed by a designer that which, which was nice and pretty and square. There's actually sags and offsets everywhere. So what the software, what fill pipe allows us to do, it allows us to understand that there is these errors, okay? And our intention at the end of the day is to create an intelligent 3D piping system, but not only just intelligent, but what's critical to us since we are working with a piping system is that we have good connectivity, we understand where the elbows are in relation to the pipe, and we want to make sure that everything is connected. So there is some rules programmatically that the software goes through. There is some tolerances that you can set as well, where if, let's say, we come to an elbow and there is an offset greater than 5 degrees, then it'll trim it for you. If it's less than degrees that are specified, then it'll try to do its best uh, to actually square it up and give you a truly 90-degree elbow. So there's a lot that's going on in the background. So, so far, all I've done... That is what comprises and makes it, quote, unquote, un intelligent. Well, the, that's correct. It's doing all the hard work that one would have to do if, if just using AutoCAD. Because today you can just use AutoCAD with CloudWorks, but then there's a lot of work that needs to be done. You need to set your UCS so many times, create custom UCSs, figure out the offsets, and fill pi CADWorks fill pipe is, does all that for you. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. Let me ask you, we've got a couple of questions that have come in, and let me stop you for just a sec. Okay. Now, you've done some really quick uh, masking of the points that were not part of this pipe network. We have a question asking, can you save this view so that you can return to it later without having to remove all of those, all those points again? Certainly, you can in CloudWorks, um, in the, because we are, when you install FillPipe, you don't have to install CloudWorks. CloudWorks is part of FillPipe. So like a CloudWorks has a utility that allows you to create the project, this actual view. So it actually saves it as a CW PRJ file. And it saves it to the drawing too. So let's say I have this drawing saved as laser scanning. I've done all the trimming, all the cleanup to my point cloud. I can actually tell my colleague, look, I've cleaned up this point cloud. Here's this one line. And then I can move on to the next, and he can take care of the piping. So you certainly can save it off for an internal workflow of some sort, so somebody takes care of the, of the 
cleanup, and then somebody else is the piping. Yes, yes, you can save the views. Okay, and one last question from our attendee, and then we'll go on. The points that you have inserted into AutoCAD, are, are they dynamically linked back to the source file? Uh, I believe maybe Mike can answer that question a little bit more. What was the question again? Uh, the question is that the point cloud that we have represented in AutoCAD, uh -huh. once it's inserted or referenced in, is the AutoCAD representation of the points dynamically linked back to the point cloud file? Um, so let's say we decided that we truly did not need a set of points and we yep. wanted to delete them permanently. Yes. So basically the CloudWorks is going to in insert the cloud. Uh, it's kind of like an X-ray if you will. So it's going to import, okay. uh, insert the cloud into the CAD system. Uh, once you detach it, uh, the cloud is no longer there, but all of the CAD uh, smart entities will remain. Excellent. And it is, it sorry, is not I'm sorry to keep interrupting you. It's no, that's not okay. raining in a, a true uh, AutoCAD point either. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of just there in the background that you can snap to it, you know, as it is an AutoCAD entity. However, it's not going to you know, eat all the memory of yeah. your CAD system, like if you were to have, you know, bring in those points yeah. into it. Much, much lighter weight. Oh, well, that, I'm sure that also helps with re regeneration. Correct. Oh, excellent. Okay, so I'm going to move on. So what I've done is I've simply picked three points, and it gave me these pipes. And like I told you, what it does mathematically goes in, and so depending on what your tolerances are, it goes in and adjusts each connection to properly place an elbow for you. So now I'm done selecting, and I'm going to press Enter. So if you see what it's done, it's actually placed the pipe and the elbows here for us. It's accurately positioned everything for us. Okay. Now we can go ahead and continue. So we have a smaller pipe. This is, an, this is actually a 3-inch pipe. And then we have another pipe here, and this is a 6-inch pipe. We need to add a T. We need to add a reducer. So how do we do that? Again, what it's doing, it's querying all the CADWorks components. All those intelligent components that are available in the catalog are being used right now. So we can, we can do this very simply by doing this. I can come in and I can say, I want to connect, um, excuse me, I want to connect these two pipes. So again, being that it's AutoCAD, we try to always focus on that uh, we need to make the software as easy as possible for all our users. So anybody can start using CADWorks Build Pipe without a lot of instruction. Just by reading the command line, they can follow through the prompts, and it basically guides them through the entire process. So here I can come in and just select the main run, select the branch, and then I can say I want a T here, and it gives me that connection. Okay. Now you'll notice there's, there's a lot of softwares out there that allows us to basically come in and add all these pipes and elbows, but what they fail to do is accurately connect these two components together, which is critical to design, because we want to go and take it out to pipe stress analysis, create an isometric drawing of it, and the only way to really do that is if you have these fittings that are truly connected. Now we'll move on, and the next thing that I want to do is I want to go ahead and just maybe automatically connect these two, and again, it tells me to select one component and then the other. And so it's automatically, it recognizes that I need a reducer here because of the point cloud density and how it's, you know, reducing to a smaller size. So then it takes us to another prompt and it says, how do you want to insert this reducer? And I have the control that I want, okay? So here I want to control, I want to be able to insert the reducer from the large weld. So I'm going to assume that the large weld is right here. I'm just going to make sure that I have my... Uh, AutoCAD uh, node on, so just to make sure I highlight the specific point that I would like, and there we go. So it inserted that reducer specifically where I wanted it to go. Now, the next thing we can do here is we have different tolerances, um, again, for the elbows, and in some cases we have, uh, we also have the tolerances for valve placement, which is what I'm moving on to now. I have the ability of coming in here and saying, I need a valve, but I have no idea what type of valve that is. Okay? So just by looking at it, we can almost tell that it's a butterfly valve. So what we can do is we can come in and give it specify a length. Okay? I come in, specify a length okay, on the back side of the flanges. I select the pipe, and it comes in and says, 
according to the specification that you have set. These are the available valves that fit this length. So then I come in, I choose that valve, and it inserts that CADWORKS valve, flanges, bolts, uh, welds if needed, all automatically. And now we have finished our piping system just that fast. So now a critical, I, a critical point here is, you know, as we go through and we isolate more uh, points, we'll need to start connecting these lines with this other new system that we've cropped out. So we have the ability of just grabbing the grip on these CADWORKS components and manipulating them very easily. I can come back in and I can say, well, I want to go ahead and, and pipe this piece of pipe here. And um, so now I have another pipe, okay? And, you know, I've noticed just for the sake of the presentation that it's a three and a half inch. So I want to change it to a, to a three inch pipe. So I'm just going to do that just for, for what I'm trying to demonstrate here. I'm going to say automatically change this pipe and let's go ahead and just change it for the demonstration to a three inch and done. So I've isolated this new area. Now I have a new piping system that continues on and I want to connect those two. Well, I want to show you how easy it is to do that. So I can come in here and say I want to connect this pipe and this pipe. And I want to add an elbow and done. Okay? It's never going to get easier than that to locate uh, and connect two different piping systems together. So fill pipe allows us to do all this at once. And then of course the last thing, if we want to go ahead and create a nice metric drawing, we can do that right away because it's all intelligent. So I'm going to come here and just create an ISO, uh, an isometric drawing. I'm going to indicate maybe what style sheet that I want to work with and then accept that and then just say, well, I want to go ahead and send all of this to Isogen. And there's the piping system, the isometric drawing created off that point cloud. Sonia, I've got to tell you, I used to work offshore, and I've drawn many, many PNIDs. And uh, yeah, I, that, that, that makes me cry for the hours of my life that I wasted. Yeah. And again, that all that, I, you know, for the purpose of the webinar, that, that was, it's, it's dependent on the right laser scanner getting the right data, that type of stuff. So you know, none of that's possible without getting you know, proper coverage on the pipes um, and that type of stuff with scanning. Okay, so I well, will pass it over to David yep. and Mike. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Well, i got to tell you, uh, Mike and David, Sonia is going to be a hard act to follow. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so the next one I wanted to talk to is, is, is of course, BIM. And, and just like plant, you know, it's the same story. So uh, you get problems with BIM. Build, buildings can complex, need to include uh, you know, interior and exterior. So they need to have the right hardware that's going to be able to um, uh, operate successfully in both uh, environments. Uh, of course, you know, it's, whether it be raining or it's nice and sunny, you know, you got to make sure that it's going to work on all those things. Um, Versatility is important. So, you know, in a lot of these buildings, either they're big or small, um, again, you need to have the ability to choose the correct field workflow, whether it be traversing through halls. Um, you know, one of the methodologies that I used to use when surveying is I would actually create, um, you know, I would traverse with scanners and then I would create, you know, just kind of spur lines off into the rooms going down a hall. So now everything is coordinated again when you import it, it's all done. Um, and sometimes remote operation is necessary. So, you know, if you're up on a roof, you know, sometimes materials on roofs, if you stand right next to the scanner, that it's going to throw it out of level. You know, sometimes you need to, to level up a scanner that's going to help you in the back end. Um, and if that's the case, uh, even if it was a total station, you want to be away from that unit. Um, so uh, the scanner needs to be operated, whether it be an iPad, an iPhone, what have you, you can do all of those things. Now, are the Leica products only iOS compatible? No, you can use Android devices as well, um, and then you can, also use the, um, you can also use the you can also use the Leica um, field controllers for the GPS and TPS. So it's the CS10, CS15, or CS25 uh, also can drive all of the uh, scanners as well. So uh, if you're already one of those customers that have those devices, you can use that to use the scanner as well. Um, 
So again, so BIM workflow. I mean, here's this lovely diagram again and again. As you can see that the field data collection combining scans, nothing changed. It's pretty linear. Um, but uh, going over into the data extraction and visualization again is where, uh, where the workflow will now explode um, and going to different places. Of course, we're going to uh, show a little snippet in uh, CloudWorks for Revit, uh, but there's plenty of other uh, other uh, programs out there too. So for I did uh, some scanning an example of an old church uh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. This was uh, dates back to old Civil War stuff. Uh, this church was used as a hospital um, for the uh, Confederate then then uh, after it was captured uh, for the uh, Federal Army. Um, so super cool sort of church, but you know the workflow. I used the free station methodology and decided not to use a traversing type of thing here. Uh, again, my favorite scan button. One button scanning is awesome. Uh, there's there's nothing better than that. Um, and then again, as you can see there from the lower picture, that I was controlling the scanner in some cases with my iPhone. So you can see that the actual scan is on my iPhone, and I can uh, I can control uh, acquire targets in the field if I had to, because um, we did have some rather precarious setups uh, with the uh, with the scanner that I needed to be away from it. So uh, and again, the workflow in the office. And again, because got the right data, I was able to use a combination method of using target and cloud to cloud registration. So uh, and that was I, that's actually one of my favorite ways to do registration. Um, some of the methodologies again, um, and that resolution, um, I used a different quality, so um, because we're a little darker, um, also that the scanner has uh, they have an automatic setting on the aperture so that you know when it's dark out, obviously each image is going to take a little longer to take. Um, so, but again, the, each scan is approximately 43 million points at that resolution. Um, I did seven setups, took two and a half hours, um, and then of course the bane of every technology is battery, uh, whether it be, uh, uh, you know, your iPhone, I mean, I, I charge my phone four times a day sometimes. Uh, same thing with scanning, I mean, you are at the mercy of the amount of power you have out in the field. Um, you know, a lot of our scanners um, are very awesome uh, with battery power. Uh, so in some systems you have uh, you have up to uh, 14 hours of battery life that you have with a system and that certainly will get you through a full day. Uh, wow. so. Now let me ask you, are the batteries replaceable in the field? Uh, yes, uh, so they're, they're what's called hot swappable. Um, so as one runs out, so the scanners are smart enough that it's going to operate on one battery at a time and then it will fully draw on that battery, then it will swap over. Um, obviously, you don't want to change the battery when the scanner is spinning around, but you know, in between setups, you can certainly, without having to shut it down, uh, pull the battery out and pull a new one in there uh, and keep going. And I can see by your photo that you've got scans on the tripod and then scans also off the tripod, so it seems exactly. like there's a lot of versatility there. Exactly. So that's, that's one of the precarious places where I put the scanner. Um, uh, probably some surveyors are cringing in their seats that I put that right on the edge, and that, that is that is a, uh, <laughs> a little toy. But uh, you know, again, it, you kind of put it where you need to get it done. Hey, uh, this is scanning on the edge. That's right. There, that's right. The bleeding edge, right there. Right? <laughs> um, so again, uh, you know, the proper data drives the workflow again. So what we'll do here is um, David's going to actually just uh, he'll demo. Uh, a little bit in uh, in CloudWorks Revit. So again, the, you know the proper data drives um, the the entire uh, workflow. Well, we are. I know this is going to be great, but David, I, I need to warn you. We're getting to about the six minute mark before we cut to questions and answers. So, all right, gonna, this will take four. I will. <laughs> all right. I will. Uh, I will do my best and, and rush through it. So here you can see very similar to. Uh, what Sonia was showing is a, a CloudWorks product inside of Revit now, so this looks right to the Cyclone database. You know, you don't have to go through any kind of conversions. Uh, it looks directly to Cyclone, pulls the points in. So once we have our points in, you know, um, you can start manipulating and working and, and working from the points. Um, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, uh, you know, zero in on an area here. We're going to work work on this little area again zeroing in on this wall I'm going to set a couple uh, set a couple levels um, that will assist us in when generating our walls so we can come over and this is more or less a, a, a revit command but we pull it forward because it, we're, we're using it in conjunction with our point cloud so we can go ahead and set a point directly from the point cloud so here you'll see it's going to grab that elevation so we can call that our bottom uh, we're going to put that on our floor plan uh, view say okay Again, we'll go into a top level here. 
all that to top. So now you can see over here it's creating our uh, creating our, our, our top and bottle, bottom levels for us and whatnot. So then now if we go again, you know, um, here we have our clipping manager so the points aren't actually being deleted. So we can go ahead and just turn back on our points. Now we're back in back into uh, back into our uh, our area that we want to work on. So then now we can go into our bottom view. So you'll see it kind of just takes a slice out of the point at that bottom view. And then now we can just kind of use those points as a reference. Um, let me open up so we can see our 3D view here. So then now we can go and just generate a wall. And then if we come over here to our wall, if we set our base constraint, so we're going to hold our bottom that we just set, and then the top constraint, we're going to go and set up our, oops, I'm sorry, here, where's the top offset? Top level. And then now when we go back into our wall, start to generate our wall, it's going to have, it's going to have the correct elevations bottom and top for our wall. And there you can see in our 3D view that it drew our wall for us and, and you know all the elevations are set correctly. And so again you're just using the points kind of in the background as a reference. Um, and, uh, and and using all of your, your Revit tools to, to go on. And, and again, you know, making sure that you have enough data is, is very critical here. You know, using selecting the correct scanner. So in this instance, it was a it was a, one of the, the higher speed scanners that you know collects more data. So we have um, better better completeness of the data to work with to be able to generate these models from. Wow, that's fantastic! Now, taking this Revit work that you're doing, could we also combine that with the CloudWorks, uh, the Intergraph CloudWorks pipe uh, field pipe software to integrate the piping for that chiller? Mm, not yet, <laughs> unfortunately. We're working on that one. <laughs> yeah. But you know, in, in Revit, we do auto uh, CloudWorks for Revit does have you know some piping tools as well. That in in uh, Revit MEP, for instance, it, it generates um, automatic pipes that are generated by a pipe placeholder. They're called, and then you can very easily create it. You know, create a true Revit uh, right. pipe entity in, in directly in Revit. Yeah. So driving the the BIM workflow. So yeah. For a lot of your BIM BIM models really determines on what the actual deliverable is and where it needs to end okay. up. Well, that, that, is, that is pretty awesome. I, I, I'm in, I think even I could do that. Now, Mike, we're going to cut to you for about two minutes. Let's yeah, hear all I'm about I'm civil gonna, surveys. I have a lot of slides on the civil survey, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom through them rather quick because uh, okay. the, the last slide is actually one of, the, one of the more important ones to go through. But you know, problems with civil surveys, so field versatility, again, it's the same problem with just about every project. You know, which, which methodology in the fields are you going to use? Um, one of the ones that I used to do because you know I did a lot of surveying in the city of Boston, so that's uh, you know that's laser scanning heaven because everything is hardscape. Property lines, um, and, and I used to do a lot of uh, what's called an Alta ACSM survey, which is land title surveys. Buildings in Boston, of course, they're very tall, uh, and in other cities, of course, they are. Awnings and overhangs, all those types of things, all need to be identified um, to create exceptions for these types of massive plans that are worth millions of dollars uh, in these title plans. Um, so again, that laser scanning is going to really help you. So you know, the old way, you're going to go out with a total station and rod, and you're going to get some massive you know, AutoCAD points like you see on the screen, um, whereas instead that you can go ahead and do uh, laser scan. And you can physically almost do the same thing virtually. Um, so the nice thing is you're putting the power of creating these plans into a person that uh, uh, knows exactly what they need to create their plans. Um, so again, here's the, here's the workflow. As you can see, data collection field registration look identical to what you're going, and then it explodes into a whole bunch of different ways. You can run a cyclone, different to pro, uh, Tobo programs, uh, whether it be uh, Cobras or AutoCAD or MicroStation. Uh, and of course, we also have another sister company called MicroSurvey. So you can also get point clouds into there as well. Um, so one of the jobs that I did um, 
I actually used both scanners, C10 and, and, and a P20, just to see what I got difference. Uh, and I just, just did three quick scans. Uh, I'm going to zoom through this quick. So um, this kind of tells a point. So the top point, top picture, you can see a spire way off in uh, off in the distance. Um, so for projects, when you're going to projects in longer range, uh, is a is a requirement. Um, and again, you're going to I would choose you know, the C10 scanner because the range is much longer than the P20. Uh, however, even though that you know the scan is going to take a little bit longer as far as time, but uh, you know the, the range many times is important. Same thing with uh, with uh, you know uh, cities rather tall buildings you need the range to get to the top. Um, so you can see here is an overall P20 register scan. You can uh, I'm just going through some of the the differences of what you would get with each scanner. Single P20 scan, and then going over to uh, you know different views of what you get from the data is it's kind of important. So sometimes you want data at different um, uh, angles, those types of things, you get good coverage. You can see there is not much difference, but you can see in the single C10 scan that spire way off in the distance uh, where it is absent in the P20. The P20 can't see that far. Um, this is the one I wanted to talk about. Uh, Again, the benefit of having a laser scanning technology on this, and this is actually a project I did in Cambridge. Huge, uh, not a large building, but it was kind of congested. Um, and you can see that you know, we scanned it, and you know, this was way back when, and a lot of cloudwork stuff didn't exactly exist, so I had to kind of make models out of this, but that's okay. Um, the point is, is on the CAD drawing, uh, you can see kind of about a third of the way down from the top, there's three little circles pointing to uh, some items up on the wall. These, this was for a, t a title survey, and these were overhangs that never would have been identified if this was not scanned. Um, and it would have, and it made a huge difference. So uh, having these exep exceptions put onto these plans and identified um, is a major deal sometimes because uh, you know surveyors have a tendency to always be looking down, um, you know, looking for uh, you know their their survey control and stuff like that. And I am still guilty of it because uh, it is just kind of bred into me. But uh, the laser scanner isn't always looking down; it looks everywhere. So you know, when you brought the point cloud and overlaid it on the point on the uh, property line, uh, you know, a lot of these things stick out like a sore thumb. Um, so you can actually identify them. So I think I'd look, and that will be uh, end for me. So I think I ended right on time. Well, I I got to tell you, Mike, the amount of information that we're seeing in the upper left hand image it's vertically phenomenal. is amazing. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And, and it brings up one of the questions that uh, one of our attendees has asked. In our first webinar, we learned that the laser scanners can't scan through water, but what about other reflective surfaces? I can tell where the windows are. Yep. Are they scanning through the glass? Yes. So, well, it, I guess the, the real answer is yes and no. Um, if the glass is nice and clean, the laser will go through it, and, and you'll scan on the other side. Uh, so you'll scan the roof, you know, that types of things. There has been projects where um, I've scanned a hotel, and I needed to get from interior to exterior, and I physically scanned the lobby from outside through the glass, uh, and then did a scan inside and registered the two together. Of course, there's a little bit of skew because of the way light travels through glass, uh, but it was cl it was close enough to what I needed to get done. Uh, if the glass is dirty, uh, you'll scan the surface. Okay. Well, that now we have another question and which is great because we've reached our Q&A portion of our presentation. Um, Mike and David and Sonia and Joseph, you know, th this has been a lot of information, but we're going to jump straight into it. So let's start with some questions that our attendees have submitted. And just as a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the question panel on the right-hand side. Um, if we don't get to it right now, we're going to try our best to get to them after the presentation, or you can contact us directly. Uh, our first great question is, and, and I think everybody's wondering this, what is the training process for a field crew in CAD staff, and how long does it take to become proficient with these systems? Um, so hardware is not hard at all. You know, it's, it's pretty much, I mean, like I said, if I've said a couple times, if you can push two buttons on the side of a screen, I think most people can figure out how to scan, uh, I'm going to say in four hours or less. Um, and then, uh, and, and you're right, the magic is where it all happens is in the software. Um, the real answer is the, 
the learning process can, can be anywhere as short as a couple of weeks to a couple of months. It's going to depend on which workflow you want to use um, and also how often that you're going to use it. Um, so like the analogy I like to use with customers is say, okay, remember when you learned how to use AutoCAD or whatever CAD platform you used? Uh, would you ever learn it if you used it for an hour or two, say, every other day? Probably not. It would take you forever to figure it out. And if you force yourself to use it every day for a few hours, you'll pick it up real fast. Um, same thing. And of course, as tools get e easier and, and more tools, more automation happens, as you can see from Sonia's uh, awesome demonstration. I mean, you pick on a cloud that makes a pipe. How easy is that? You know, so uh, it, it depends on what you want to do. So. Um, that's the real answer. Okay. Well, I, and you know, remembering back to the days many, 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 many years mm -hmm. ago when I was learning CAD, uh, I can relate to that. So here's a quick one for you. How much does a, P20, a P20 scanner weigh? About 25 pounds. About 25 pounds. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think I could lift that. Yeah. Uh, can any company adopt any solution or certain solutions optimized for certain applications? Uh, yeah, uh, that's kind of a, a double-sided question. So uh, the answer, again, there is yes or no. So um, I kind of liken the, an the answer to that is, um, you know, contact your local rep, and he'll come in and customize the solution for that, that company. You know, what's your immediate goal? What's your long-term goal? Those types of things. So, uh, you know, the technology, technology can certainly uh, grow and evolve as the customer uh, expand their boundaries of knowledge, if you will. So you can always start small um, and then grow and go into other uh, industries. You know, case in point, we have a great customer that bought scanning to do civil survey work. Now he does 80% of his work is actually in the plant arena, um, and he actually he evolved into that type of role. Um, so it depends on what you want to do. Okay, Mike. You know, you are a wealth of information. But we're going to listen to Sonia for a second. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sonia, we've got a question from an attendee specifically for you. Well, actually, you and Joseph. Can you go a step further from the demonstration that you were doing um, to the point where you can create spool drawings for shop fabrication? Well, of, of course, we can. Actually, that's all part of Isogen. So you can set up Isogen to create the, uh, the the type of isometric that you want. So if you want to create spools, you can do that. We have very easy to use tools. It's basically a button. You say, this is where my start my spool starts. This is where it ends. The minute you push to the push you push the button to create the isometric drawings, it'll create those spools for you. So it just depends on what level, uh, to what level you want to go to. So yes, but that is customizable and you can certainly do it very easily. Ah, uh, you know, I I can't believe this. You've made me that. want to get back into piping. <laughs> uh, we have another question for you, and, and that's saying a lot. We have another question for you. Is it difficult to create custom libraries for a valves and other mechanical objects? No, it is not at all. Imagine an, an Excel sheet, okay, and you have a valve identified by its length, its weight, its properties, and it's just an item. It's just a table. All you have to do is create a table, say it's a valve, and add the item in there. And it's, it's wow. as simple as that. That is pretty simple. Well, guys, I'll tell you what. I, you've got me sitting in my office, and I want to get a scanner, and I'm trying to think of how many billions of points I would need to get all my, my tchotchkes on my shelves. Um, <laughs> and I've got that in my mind, so I may be calling you guys eventually to help me figure that out. But, unfortunately, we've reached the top of the hour, so it's time to wrap this all up. Um, I want to say thank you again to Leica and Integraph for your presentation today. And for everybody who attended and would like more information, please, we do have this information available after the presentation. Go to catalyst.com backslash 3D hyphen scanning hyphen hardware. Again, that is catalyst.com backslash 3D hyphen scanning hyphen hardware, and we're going to have a copy of the slides, the links, and contact information for Leica. And within 24 hours, we're going to have a recording of today's webcast up so that you can have my dulcet tones and Mike's 
great laugh and Sonia is great information, <laughs> probably only one of those you actually want, uh, into perpetuity. So I want to say thank you again to everybody who attended. Thank you for coming and spending your lunch time with us and for your interest and participation. We've got a lot of great questions that we're going to keep going through. If we don't contact you directly, please do contact us. Mike, David, Sonia, Joseph, I want to say thank you for all the great work that you guys do. You, you gave us a lot, of, a lot of information in just a short period of time. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And we hope to see you back again for a future Catalyst webcast, and we want you all to have a great day. Y'all take care. Take care now.